Now, um, I only arrived, I arrived a bit early on Friday rather than yesterday because I would have been completely jet lagged. Um, but I'm not going to really talk much about Palmerston North today because on Friday it's only going to be about Palmerston North and that's going to reveal the results of a survey that you, many of you may or may not have been involved with and that's in a sense your internal assessment and I'm now here to sort of do what's the outsider's view and to marry the insider's view and outsider's view and to see whether there are differences and so on. So forgive me for not talking about Palmerston North, but that may be a blessing. Um, simply because I want to really talk about the movement of cities, what's happening with cities. And I think you all know that cities and city regions are really the wealth creators in the world. Less, you know, and they're much more dominant than they, they used to be. So I'm going to take you a bit on a tour around, around places, but particularly focus on the difference between... What's better or worse between a smaller city and a bigger city? What can a smaller city do that a big city can't do and, and, and in reverse? Um, that's working. So I did arrive. The first thing I heard was, this is the biggest cluster in the southern hemisphere of intellectual capacity, was the first sentence I heard, more or less. Is that true? You said one, <laughs> right? You were, the, were you the man? <laughs> it was someone else, probably. No, no, that's right. Anyway, so that was quite interesting because you arrive in a small airport and someone tells you that. Anyway, um, I'm not saying I don't believe it, by the way. But I'm just telling you that that's w what I was told. Now, the central question uh, in all of the issues that we're discussing is the major transformations that you all know about. Um, and I, so I won't go into those. But those have affected all sorts of places. You know, the larger cities, for example, have become much larger. Auckland has the highest proportion as a capital city, I gather, of any city in the world with 42% of the population. So Seoul in Korea, for example, has 30%. So there's a real massive concentration. And lots of that energy comes from places like, like, like here. The other thing about that massive change, of course, is the world is a smaller place. I mean, just looking around here, there are lots of people who look as if they probably came from somewhere else a while back, I don't know, or recently. And that mass movement of people, of course, has had a major effect on, on what cities feel like. And clearly, you having in a university uh, exacerbates that, obviously, because lots of people come from abroad. And that then has, in turn, a sort of effect on the identity of places. People who've been here forever might say, what's this stuff going on, and so on. And that's what really the Intercultural City book was about. And, you know, in some places, the Intercultural City Book did a study, in fact, of Auckland and what happened when all those population mixes uh, occurred, what was good, bad, and so, and so on about it. I'm only raising that because you are a refugee settlement place. That obviously has implications now and in time. The other thing, as we all know, is the sort of here-there phenomenon. And as I arrived Friday morning in Auckland at the airport waiting for my flight, you can see there they are all hooked up, uh, all four of them. I just had to quickly do that before they suddenly started closing their computers. But anyway, you get the drift of what all that's about. I don't need to elaborate that. But what that also means is there's all sorts of virtual connections. And people might say, well, does place matter? when we can be zooming around in space. Well, in fact, all the work research shows that the more we can do that, the more place matters, the more we want to have somewhere to anchor. <coughs> In third spaces, a third space is obviously a place like the library, which is not home, not work, and, and, and so on. And all of this is quite unsettling for, for, for many people, and lots of people sort of really discuss that we're moving from a situation where we're, we used to plan very much about cities in a predict and provide model. We need 1,600 metres of tarmac this year. Let's do it. You know, off we go. Very clear cut. And that is rather simple to do, I think, relatively speaking. But planning for people who are moving around in the way I've just described is a completely different matter because you're trying to create atmosphere and so on. So in general, you can say that these shifts make places feel, in general, quite fragile 
uh, in general, which means that we've also got to be alert about what is going on. And some people say, talking about Edinburgh, this is a shop in Edinburgh called The Paradigm Shift, some people say that requires a paradigm shift in thinking about cities and places, that there's an old way of thinking about it and a newer way of thinking about it. And I've discussed that a bit with people I've interviewed over the last few days. And it really puts cities at a crossroads to thinking, how do I respond to this? Do I just say the business as usual approach, the old way we did things, predict and provide 1,500 metres of tarmac? Will that be enough to make a great city? Now, some people find all these changes that I'm talking about sort of generally quite invigorating and so on, and others think exactly the opposite and are, are, are slightly defensive about it. Here's a piece of public art in, in, in where is it, in Los Angeles. Anyway, I'm not saying that's like this in Palmerston North, but nevertheless, there are some people who would prefer this not to be the case, these shifts. And, you know, I don't want to talk much about the economy, but we know there's an agrarian economy, industrial economy, and increasingly economies are based on knowledge. I know that you used to call yourself the knowledge city or whatever. But people more now realizing, how do you get knowledge? How do you get things that add value in agriculture, in food production, or any of these things, in other spheres, IT? We first need some form of creativity before the knowledge comes and the innovation comes. And because of that recognition, more and more people are talking about this notion of the creative city. Now, many people think that when one uses the word creative, it automatically means only artists, or other people think it might be only scientists, which doesn't mean that both those categories are, of course, incredibly important. But you can see what I'm talking about is a much broader sweep. Now, the problem is that a lot of places are saying that, oh, I don't know, let's say 100, doesn't matter, but a lot, if you look on the internet, there'll be lots of places, Creative Vancouver, Creative this, Creative that. And the question for a place like yours is then to say, well, okay, if everybody's onto this thing, well, what is distinctive and special about us? What makes us different from all the other places? Can you see these images, or should we, is, is that okay? Can you see them enough? Okay, good. Very clear. Thank you, Mr. Green, or <laughs> whatever you've got there. <laughs> um, uh, so anyway, this is from the Shanghai Expo last year. And there was a pavilion of the future, which is a bit like a version of your department, Cheryl. Cheryl. And what everybody was talking about in this pavilion of the future is really, can we have a vision again of how all of this fits together, how we can rethink you know, the nature, the city, dense living or more spread out living, all of these issues that, that, that you probably confront in a daily basis. And so what I'm really saying is this is an agenda that isn't only just here in New Zealand or in, on the North Island. So let's look at this a bit more closely. Um, now, one of the big things is this thing about cities competing. Of course, they're always, in a sense, they're competing. But now it's much, much more intense, which is one of the reasons why Auckland, relative to all the other cities, is so much larger, because it's trying to be part of the Melbourne, etc., etc., nexus. And that, of course, affects places like Palmerston North. Now, these are just cities. You know, these are all the top cities in the world that have an impact. You might think, why have I got Miami there? Miami is the financial center for South America, all the money, the dirty, clean money, you know, put it in a safe spot. That's where the banking center is of, of, of Latin America. So these cities are all the sort of ones that are hubs and so on. And I'm asking myself the question, how do you fit into that? Now, whether you like it or not, you might say, why the hell are you hanging on about all of these cities that have nothing to do with us. Well, they do have something to do with you because we're all obviously part of some sort of connected network of cities. Now, I think you know the sort of city we have, and I don't want to get into architectural theory, as you can imagine. People call it the modernist city and stuff like that, which had a sort of confidence, the sort of buildings you know, you know, very often skyscrapers with often quite bland, uh, settings and stuff like that, and some of them are beautiful and so on. But for many, all of that turned a bit into a sort of dystopia. And part of the reason is that the people who thought they were in charge of city making were essentially those people concerned with hardware. So 
you know, hardware folks, you know who the hardware folks are. So the software folks, you know, know about how activities work, how economies work, and communities work, and all of that, were really very much pushed to the side. I mean, in Australia, they always talk about the roads rates and whatever else the other are, as I forgot what it is. And here is the big shift, because that, people are recognising, that is the sort of functional city. It's all about function. It's not about, you know, how the city feels. Now, of course, engineering is a fantastic discipline. So, you know, things have got to stand up, bridges have got to stand up, doors have got to shut, this ceiling, I hope, doesn't fall down. All of that, of course, we recognise that. But that mindset often leads to things that are not really sympathetic. If you're thinking about the city as something where humans live, as distinct from cars move, and that creates a completely different setting. Once you put the person, the pedestrian, and all of that centre stage, there's a completely different mindset that takes place. And that's one of the big battles happening in the world. And you may have been to many of these cities, by the way. The people who planned them didn't want this result, but that is the result of a certain form of planning. Another form of, sorry, that's the pharmacy in North Korea, get rid of that quickly. Um, anyway, you know, that, 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 the only reason I'm saying that, that's a sort of no environment. You know, if you make a distinction between a yes environment and a no environment, I think we can broadly say that's a no environment. But some of the, this still goes on, this is Shenzhen, you know, it goes on and on. And I'm talking a bit for the moment about bigger cities. I'll come down to the ones of your size as we move along. Now, so what I'm really saying is from the sensory to the, to the uh, function to the sensory perspective, it's quite interesting. I took this photo at the bus station. You know the bus station over there, where, there, there, there. I just thought, this is quite, I don't really know what to say about this. Either this is a work of art, or there are too many messages. I'm not quite sure, but let's just say for the moment it's interesting. Um, but can you see there's a different perspective having that as your result than other forms of environment. And so in fact, I may think that car park, which is, I think it's a good attempt, you know, you might say it's not the nicest car park in the world, but it certainly looks better than 80% of other car parks that you normally find. So that's, I think, positive. But looking at the other big cities that are trying to make this mark because of this competition, this, as you probably know, is Dubai, in the promotional material, of course it's all green, isn't it? It's green stuff like this. This is the real experience if you're going through Dubai. And actually, it's at one level quite interesting, but at the other level, you know, again, not necessarily human scale. So you're getting the idea of what I'm talking about. And this is Paris reinventing itself, etc., uh, etc. Et so there's a certain sort of thing that happens. And one of the things that does happen is a lot of red public art. I don't know if you've noticed that most public art is red. Um, it's just something that I've noticed. And so, oh, we built this thing that's slightly soulless. That's going to be a red public art in front of it. Which is sort of trying to retrofit something that should have been in advance uh, thought about. Of course, you can be humorous about it if you like. But, but nevertheless, you get the drift, which is sort of... Sorry, I don't want to be horrible about animals. But, I mean, that's what some people call the lipstick on the gorilla strategy. Um, which is basically... Uh, you, you, you get the general idea. So some bits of this work is sort of stunning, but of course it's about mass movement of people and so on, and perhaps people in Palmerston are precisely here because they don't want all of that. But what you do notice, another piece of red public art, uh, is that there's more and more of this spectacularizing the city, making it feel spectacular in various ways, but all of that, I mean, there's nothing particularly wrong with that. And uh, even McDonald's uh, looks different uh, than it normally does. And so that's, you know, that's your version, and I think it's great. Uh, uh, down the road, the road way. Uh, no, it is great. Uh, but there is actually a different approach. So what I'm really saying is there are battles about how the city works. And it's essentially a simplifying between the hardware thinking and, let's say, combining that with software thinking. Together. And that is really the matter. And to do the latter requires having more skills in the room at the same time. That requires, there's lots of implications in terms of organization structure, 
that the city does not work in silo, it works horizontally, the budgets are shared. All of this you know, so I'm not telling you anything you don't know. But unless that happens, unless it's jointly decided, everything I'm saying is going to be very much an uphill battle. So what we're really then talking about, to put it in the language that I've heard you use, which I think is good language, is what's moving away from just building infrastructure to making place or placemaking, i.e. making a place out of space that has some physical stuff in it. And that, we'll talk about that more on Friday, let's leave that for the moment. So here is an example of your classic place, which is a place, as distinct from just a thing in the environment. But here, here you can see Paris is doing that, you know, how they're softening that building, that building is a hydroponic, a hydroponic, um, you know, a thing on the, on, on the outside and so on. So you can already see there's a completely different aesthetics emerging once you look at things from how does it feel like perspective as distinct from purely the functional. I mean, this is in New Zealand. Um, now, a lot of people start their vision about cities by starting about car parking. You never can have a vision for a city if you start with car parking. <laughs> and you'll be surprised to learn that still too many cities talk a lot about car parking rather than saying where we want to go. Then where do we want to go? We'll sort the car parking out later once we know where we want to go. So car parking comes in for this awkward by the way, you'll be recognizing it. Um, so that is a real danger. Um, and I'm sure Palmerston North doesn't fall into that trap. Uh, I hope not, anyway. Anyway, now the other thing that is really a driver, apart from that shift I just described, and one of the reasons for this shift is this thing about talent. Everybody, the success of a city depends on how many talented people with, I mean, they don't need to be young, often they're young, but they can be old, talented people, skilled people, and stuff like that. Has your city got? How many are leaving? And how many are coming? What's the churn? Is there, are there more coming and staying or more leaving? And that is the key issue. And if you summarize, and I'm trying to summarize a lot of stuff in three words, the three things they're interested in is livability, creativity, which is like a currency. Creativity, i.e. the possibility to do things and be imaginative and so on. And thirdly, somehow going with the grain of your distinctiveness. Now, it's quite interesting, CEOs for Cities, interesting organization. About 15 years ago, 80% of people chose the job and company first and then the city. These statistics have shifted around. They now choose the city and then within that, the company and job. Now, that is a dramatic change because that means then what does it attract the people you want? And then you get back to this thing about placemaking, attractiveness, quality of life, all of those things. So you even see shops like here in Helsinki called the talent shop um, or, you know, deep, you know, these are ads. This is in Sydney. You know, I just saw it. Just you're walking past and someone says that. So this is the major thing. So what makes a place that's livable? And I think ultimately, a Palmer's North obviously has some of the ingredients. It's a strange combination of that intimate feel you associate with very small places with its opposite, which is, let's call it the cosmopolitan thing. So it's somehow finding a good blend between these two things. And in a funny way, I think George Street feels a bit like that. You know, next door is called Barista Cafe or whatever it is. And then there's Mr. India and so on, I think, just a bit further down. So that is, in a sense, the key thing. How can you do both of these things at the same time? Because the essence of a city, as distinct from living in the middle of nowhere, is it's about exchange, transaction, meeting, doing all of these things. And some of that is social. But primarily, of course, it is about actually wealth creation in one way or another. The wealth has to be generated from something. But certainly it's these things. So what lots of cities are trying to do, I'm just going to show you a couple of examples which are quite dramatic, which you probably will know, are essentially retrofitting conviviality. Conviviality is basically the art of living together. Retrofitting conditions where people can bump into each other, do things together, and so on. So this is looking from the mayor's window in Chicago. So he saw that. 
and said, I don't particularly like that, and turned it into that. So this is Millennium Park. Met many of the urban folks here will all, of course, know that. But I think that is an example of what we're just talking about. Or here, Seoul. The amount of places that are getting rid of infrastructure rather than building infrastructure is immense, and this is quite a dramatic example. So this was then eight kilometers, got rid of the road, and is now, it's called Chunggye Chung, is the central meeting place in Seoul. So the mayor was asked, who then became the president, uh, where did the traffic go? And he said, I don't know. Because <laughs> traffic finds its own way. You know, because if you've got enough networks, if you've got enough small streets and other streets rather than one big street, but lots of small ones, it sort of tends to disappear. Or in New York, again, I promise to get to smaller cities, don't worry, but it's the same lesson always. But I think it's why these bigger cities are interesting is because it's more difficult doing these things in bigger cities because there's more power play going on and the lots going on there. So the High Line, as many of you will know, was a linear, is a linear park uh, going across from the meatpacking district, which has become one of the most popular places in America. And also what they did, you probably know about these experiments of just putting uh, in 42nd Street, in some of the main streets of New York, just putting chairs. They couldn't get rid of the chairs in the end, so now they've had to make some of these areas permanent so people can just sit. So what you can see is people are trying to recapture the city. Now, I don't need to tell you that the streets, they're not streets, the roads in Palmerston North are rather wide. I'm just sort of obvious observation, but that has a lot of implications. And in a sense, across the road, you're doing a version of, this is the Palmerston North version of addressing that sort of issue that I've just been, just been talking about. So I mentioned this thing about creativity. I just want to remind you that the key thing in, for cities to be adaptable is firstly to have an environment where people are allowed to be curious. If they're allowed to be curious and have an idea, discuss it, they might have some imagination, out of which some creative ideas may develop. And when they've gone through the reality checker, it may become an invention and then an innovation. I note that your strategy says caring, sustainable, vibrant, and innovative. And I found that quite interesting, because how the hell did you get to the innovation, which you call, that? in theory, you used to have the word creative, and it. it's quite important to remember that innovation is the result of another set of things that happened beforehand. So anyway, that sense of curiosity is really quite important. This is Pittsburgh Children's Museum, which has this massive sign which says curiosity in front of it. So what this is about, what I'm talking about, is this environment where you're allowed to have ideas. And this is something we'll talk about on Friday. The capacity of Palmerston North to turn having the words on pieces of paper, because I've read lots of your pieces of paper, into reality. There's one thing writing the policy document, the strategy. There's the other thing saying, Christ, where the 95% of hard work starts, which is to knit that round. And then to generate discussions around it and so on. So I just wanted to remind ourselves of that. Now, when people talk about creativity, of course they talk about artists, and yes, we do want artists, and artists can sometimes be wonderful, not always, but in general, it's better to have a lot of artists rather than hardly any. Um, but this is more than that, and this is a Venice Biennale. I promise to not make any more boring art. I think that's quite nice that they put that there. But it also includes the creative economy sector. I talked to a couple of people within that sector, which is very important. Design, new media, all of that, which adds values to product, product and services. And some of you may have heard of Richard Florida, who wrote a book called The Rise of the Creative Class. So it includes those people who are people who are researchers and all these designers and all of that. But when I think of creativity, I'm thinking about a bit more. Because it also includes, obviously, business people, especially bureaucrats. I'm incredibly interested in creative bureaucrats. I love the idea of bureaucracy, word heavy, dull, creative, apparently light, the tension between the two, fantastic. Um, uh, talk more about that again on Friday. All these things we want to talk about on Friday. 
But anyway, but a creative city, of course, is one that allows ordinary people to make the extraordinary happen if given a chance. And so that's very much about uh, it's an empowerment process as well. And as it says there, it provides the conditions as a city for people to think, plan, and act with imagination, and then therefore to be taken seriously. Because if they're not, like, a, like in biology, if one isn't adapting in that way, one tends to shrivel and, 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 and decline. And what that often means, and this is one of the big issues about this shift from infrastructure planning to placemaking, is it's absolutely vital to cross boundaries. Your service needs to cross, I mean, you know this already, but I mean, with other services and so on, because only together can, in a sense, the result be achieved. Now, initially, all this stuff that I've been talking about was very much the big cities. And this is now cascaded down into secondary and smaller cities. And so initially it was cities, these are sort of European cities largely, apart from Minneapolis. But these are one, cities we associate at the second level who've done things. Everybody knows about Bilbao, just as an example of its complete regeneration and transformation physically, etc., etc. But what's interesting is there's another group of cities which are smaller, which are the same size as Palmerston North, who are doing incredible things. Now, I happen to have worked in the first three of the, or the four of those cities in great detail. And they, I think, in some ways, are more astonishing than those other ones because somehow the problem of smallness is it can become parochial, as we know. But if a few people are facing the same direction, one can, of course, achieve more because you've got less, less people to persuade. And uh, I mean, I'll, only, I'll highlight a couple of examples about these cities as, as we move on. So what I'm really saying is this creativity agenda is moving down these layers of cities to the layer of city that is you. Sorry, I'm looking at you as if you are Palmerston North, but you know what I mean, a city of your size. So that's the Bilbao type city, you know, a million, and then these others are smaller, 100,000 and so on. So what they're doing, these smaller cities, is recreating streets, which is why I keep on saying there's a difference between a road and a street. I know you know the difference, but lots of people seem to think that a road and a street is the same thing. And what makes great cities, of course, is great streets. But this is Freiburg. Freiburg is the green capital of Europe, which the guy, they had a problem with a nuclear plant going to be put there, a waste disposal plant. Chernobyl happened at the same time. The council, you can imagine what happened, they then decided to become a solar city. Yeah? And this was clearly to do with that crisis. So here's the opera house saying, in what sort of future do we want to live? And here are a complex of buildings, this is called the Sunship. And this Sunship has 80 buildings. This is offices, retailing, and all of that. All, of course, carbon neutral. This is just one project. Yeah? It's not the, the only project, it's just one project. They've got several hundred passive houses, yeah? There are 125,000 people. So all of this is possible. And they went through the creativity index as well and scored quite highly on certain things. And the difference was the guy who was really, I suppose, responsible, let's call him that, who's been there 25 years, said, we had three aims. I've forgotten the third one. The first one was a version of we move towards carbon neutrality, whatever the words were 25 years ago. The second one, we want mixing between rich and poor, and the third I forgot. And then he said, and we meant it. <laughs> That's the difference between having a document. And he said what that meant was immediately we had to have a major program of educating developers about why this would be to their advantage. So that's clever thinking. So the result is these are just some of these solar houses. But the feeling of the place is different. I'm not saying you should green your tram lines, but I'm sure in New Zealand they'll say, no, you can't do that because of some issue to do with risk assessment or something like that. And I'm not, you know, of course we want to be safe, but anyway, they don't seem to have a problem. These are all this electrical stuff going there. They don't want to see it. So it looks and feels different. Uh, not everywhere, because this is the Solar Institute, which is now moved there, where 930 people work of which 480 or so are quite high-level scientists inventing products and so on. So these things can generate a virtual cycle. Another example here is Arnhem. 
This is what's he called, Escher. You know Escher, the staircase that goes like that? That's the staircase of Escher, his school. And that place, just around the corner from there, the city, which owns various properties, said, we've got a good art school with fashion, young fashion people coming out. So they gave them shops. So each one of these shops is a different young fashion designer. So they can be there for three years. They have their studios there and stuff like that. That, of course, has led to other things coming in, like music centres. And Arnhem is not exactly the centre of the universe, but it's become, through a simple strategic action, saying, we've got these empty shops, let's intervene, having the courage to intervene. So this is a city of your size. Here's another city of your size, Tilburg, again, this is Holland, just coincidentally, and said, okay, they've got a textile museum. And I thought, oh shit, we're going to a textile museum. This was about regenerating cities. I thought, oh, I don't want to see another piece of textile machinery. Anyway, the first thing that happened was the guy who ran the museum had nothing to do with never run a museum in his life, lesson one. He was an anthropologist. And what he did, he made the museum a centre for new creation of textiles, using some of the old machinery, getting sponsorship from the machinery makers, because of course they want people to use these things. So the thing was completely the opposite of what I thought. So I was delighted. Um, here's another place, I know it's not cold here, Umeå. I worked with them strongly. That's in the Arctic. It's now European City of Culture next year. So it's quite an accolade, yeah? Arctic City, European City of Culture, what the hell have they got to say about anything? Anyway, they've been onto this creativity agenda for years. And one of the leaders of this, if we can call it a movement, taught there uh, for 10 years. But the sort of thing they do is here. I'm just giving you just one example of the many things they do. This is just the electricity company saying, let's have some fun. So over the city, there are these things, which is wireless, connected, all of that sort of stuff, yeah? And because it's very cold, they have these things over your head that keep you warm. Now, of course, it's crazy at one level, but what they're doing, this is, I mean, these are people who are trying to make money. It's the utility company. It's not, you know, uh, some artist. But so you see that there's so much, in a sense, the playfulness. I'm really trying to highlight that all of this should be partly also about playfulness. Like here, the woods they've got just nearby. You can see, you can get the drift of what I'm trying to talk about. But even if you take another extreme of a poor place, which is Tirana. Tirana, incredibly poor. The mayor, and I feel you could do it in some of these places I've seen around here, <coughs> said, OK, well, let's just paint the city. I mean, does that make you feel depressed? Or does this Mondrian painting make you feel less depressed? So he said the psychology which we're back to the sensory, makes a real difference. How you see things, and I spoke to one of your Maori people today, and he was saying, they're so, well, I, can't, I can't see the colour in the city, he was saying. So, you know, I'll just give another little example. See, there's 200 buildings, it all looked like this, and here is a sign to the airport. It's pretty really clear which direction the airport is, yeah? So, again, this was a grey building, he said, I can't solve your problems internally, but if I make the physical environment, and I'm not saying it's only colour, of course there are hundreds of other ways of doing it, uh, you can make a difference. Let's go even further down. Tiny cities, you probably know about the slow food movement, well there's the slow city movement of cities under 50,000, and although that sounds all very nostalgic, it's the opposite. It's using cultural resources, food, obviously being ecological and all of that, and thinking about the virtues of slowness, but being, in a sense, if I can use that old-fashioned word, cool about being slow. So it's not like I'm dull because I'm slow, it's actually I'm switched on because I'm slow, because I'm reflecting on life, I'm clear-headed, and so on. So that's one major, I mean, there are about 77 European cities that are part of that uh, movement. Or here, Here's a place in Wales called Hay on Wye, which became the sort of book centre of Britain. There are 43 bookshops in this small place, books in the public realm. Then you suddenly have a festival, lots of people at work are coming there, etc., etc., etc. So I won't bang on about that, but in any place, this is a very small place in Italy, which decided it had declined just simply to paint the doors. And then 
because of that a restaurant came in, because of that a new shop that sold food, blah de blah de blah, I mean sort of deli type food. So all I'm really trying to say is each city has resources which could be used imaginatively. Now even where I live, which is not quite the middle of nowhere, there's this guy who I think is a regenerator, but he's just done a cafe, but this is green, the green shop here is the biggest internet seller of green products in Britain. Huh? <laughs> this is my local garage, yeah? Huh? So I love the idea that he's a garage, a car guy, yeah? And he set up this parallel business. So what I'm saying is I've already heard ideas within Palmerston North, and I'm not saying that you should do, adopt any of these ideas, but I've heard enough ideas to know that collectively uh, a lot could happen. And here, this is where culture comes in. What's the culture of a place? Does it allow this sort of idea to come, or is it not allowed? It's sort of, as it says there, the other invisible hand. Because so much of what's happening in a city is invisible. You can't really see what's going on. And so really what's very important is for the city to show what it's doing. So for example, sustainable. The, I can see that you've got bins there which says recycle this, which is fine. But where else do I know, walking around Palmerston North, that you are sustainable? What, what, what's telling me? I mean, we could use another term. We could say vibrant. Where else do I know? The street is vibrant, clearly, etc., etc. So showing and revealing these things, which is what a lot of events management ultimately is about, is revealing the hidden um, and making it expressed. As it says there, making the invisible visible or the intangible, making that tangible in some sort of sense. Like it says here in Freiburg, behind these doors very clever people are working. So, so often when you go through a city, as I've walked around Palmerston North, in these streets here I can see what's going on, but apart from, you know, all the things when you come in and there are all these sort of shops telling you to buy something, you hardly know what is going on behind the scene. And some people obviously say, well, therefore, we need cows as our marker, lions, bears, I don't know, flamingos, whatever, jaguars, orcas. These are all cities you know. That's Vancouver and so on. So what I'm saying is what, I'm saying is what this says here. These cities that really seem to be working well, the citizen feels that they're a maker, shaper, co-creator of the city and that is another deep trend in policy making as you well know another word for that is sort of saying I'm engaging with communities but but actually you're co-making the city together and if we add all of that what I've said together it's a different platform for thinking about urban development and if you then summarize that in five sentences what makes a great place it's a place which is anchored in some sense, rooted. It's a place, obviously, of possibility, connection, and somewhere where you can grow imagination, grow learning and inspiration. So if we look at all these elements in Palmerston North, where are the places of inspiration? Timanawa has a lovely sign, but there's a car park in front of it. You know, I mean, that's not the best way to present some of the best of, of, of the city. So that's, as I said, about the past, memory, heritage, all of these things. And it is interesting, and again, that's a Friday thing. I have to say, I did travel 250 kilometers yesterday around your region, from Fielding to Martin to blah, 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 Bulls, the police station in Bulls. Isn't it lovely, that page of the thing? Anyway, Sanson, da 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 Anyway, all of these places, Wanganui and so on. And I have to say, some of these other cities, places, towns, have done perhaps more than, 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 than has happened here. So, heritage, this is obviously an element of your heritage. What's that place called? It's the, it's, yeah, hot, the kiln, where you've got that thing going out, yes. So it's all about that, how that's recycled the past, how reused, which is obviously a classic thing because the past helps the future in some sense. And then possibility. I think this library is a possibility place. This is Singapore National Library, which has a possibility room. Lots of people seem to be walking into it. I don't know what they were doing. 
then connection is obviously this cultural connection thing and learning of course and so on so that's all pretty clear and then imagination and inspiration so what we've really got in summary is yes I'm going to do 10 more minutes and then we can talk about this is these places that seem to work might have something we ultimately call buzz but what it's about is the encounter that you have which is often just by chance the capacity to cross cross fertilize or cross a discipline someone who's doing something nearly like you but slightly different that you feel a sort of a catalytic sort of event happening so you can't see that but that chair says let's have a serendipitous meeting um, or that dog something sort of, doesn't matter but when that dog met that dog, it's quite interesting. The one <laughs> wanted to eat the other, but that's a different matter. Um, you get the drift of what I'm saying. This is all more about chance encounter. And in a sense, Ideas Festival, because you probably know, I mean, I've worked a lot in Adelaide. Uh, they had an Ideas Festival. Brisbane's got one. And there are more and more Ideas Festivals, because people are realizing, unless we gather the conversation, create the conversation, feel safe about the conversation, we talked about conversation the other day, and if you have the conversation, not much is going to happen. Um, and so on, and so on. And one of the things people told me about Massey, this building may be fine, is how do you have a conversation across disciplines in Massey? All these research centres, which are different blocks in places, how do these interesting people communicate, etc., etc.? So let's go to this final section. Right. Okay. This is my statement for the day. You're small enough to make it happen in theory. And you're big enough to be taken seriously. Because everybody in New Zealand at least knows that the parts of the North exists. So you're small enough and big enough. And that is an interesting conundrum and potential. But why are you going to use it? Now don't read the words, because I think I put too many words on here. But broadly, what's easier? Is it easier to be, have leadership, foresight, and all of these things and deliver things in a very big city or in a small city? Well, delivering things in theory is easier in a small city because the complexity of big cities, often dysfunctional, is more difficult. Another question, does one do it? It's a different issue. Leadership depends. Smaller cities can be a bit enclosing. So, that's one thing to look at. Who's better at that? And of different forms of leadership. There's the leadership... Sorry, I'm always being anti-car parking. I do think we need car parking. I'm just saying, let's talk about that last. But this is the leadership that talks about car parking first. The more innovative, visionary leadership tries to tell a story of Palms North, where young people, this cluster here, older people, whereas older people over there, somehow can jointly agree on some story that, that, that is ideally compelling, that therefore one not quite sings off the same song uh, sheet, but at least is aligned. This next thing, okay, who's better? A bigger city, a smaller city? Having critical mass, being a transactional hub. Critical mass is, of course, the big problem for the smaller city. There's never quite enough of it. So I was talking to young people about, well, where can I hear salsa music in past North? And they were saying, well, da -da -da -da. there's not enough critical mass to have an audience to keep that going. So, but you know about that. Transactional hub where you can transact. Clearly, it's easy to communicate in a small city because the amount of meetings you can have within 10 minutes is incredible. Whether you can future-proof and actually take the risk to be let's say, the sustainable or the creative city, I leave that open. In theory, I think the smaller city should be able to, from the examples I tried to show earlier. So, then we've got this thing. Is a part of North just an appendage to Auckland and Wellington? Or could you be somehow the centre of the universe? And I think, actually, that's a reasonable ambition. But I know people feel Palmerston North is very comfortable. The danger of being comfortable is complacency and stuff like that. So this may not be what some people want. But in the end, 
Something of that nature needs to happen because there are risks on the horizon that we can talk about again on Friday. So which city is better? I'll only focus on the first one. To move from this urban engineering paradigm, very hardware driven, to what we've been discussing, which is what I'm calling creative city making, which is blending hardware and software. The very big cities have to go that way. They know their competition is so intense, they've got to create environments that are just, from an emotional sense, more satisfactory. I leave it up to you to decide what advance the North can do that. So urban engineering, as we said, is a lot about doing things well, like engineering here, but there's some weaknesses. Attracting and keeping talent. Of course we know you've got Massey and so on and so on. But the reality is, I interviewed quite a few people today, and said, have many of your friends left? The generalized message was, I'm sorry to say, and you know this already, was the more ambitious and interesting people of my friends, unfortunately, did leave. So that is, of course, the big threat to Palmerston North, because the question is, who is going to be the next generation of leaders in Palmerston North? Who are, they, who are those people going to be? So here are some of your young women, and here are some of your young guys, randomly, in front of you, Colin. But anyway, it's a question of, are these people going to stay? So that is perhaps one of the major problems, as we know, for, 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 for a city of this size. But when we talk about talent, I don't want to forget old talent, because we always tend to think that it has to be you know, up to the age of 27 or something like that. Although I think I love you and you're wonderful and all but have great potential. But unless, given we've got an older population emerging, unless we look at that positively, we won't go anywhere. Creating a rich, deep experience. I think from my talks with the Youth Council and others today, clearly the bigger city has an advantage, can be dysfunctional. Again, you know all of this, but I think I'm saying enough things about the smaller city where the smaller city can do better for you not to think, oh, it's just all about big cities. So that very much, this experience thing, is absolutely key. What does it feel like walking down George Street as contrast to Fitzherbert Street? So one of the things, then, being bold. Now the interesting thing, I'm going to pick up being bold, some of the things that you've achieved in the past, and I know people say you're slightly risk averse, were actually quite risky. I mean, when you decided to have the university, that was risky. And you got the university. Obviously, the whole square thing was risky. So nobody's saying you should do a Dubai. But what is happening is the way infrastructure is seen. I mean, this is just, you can see it's all sort of slightly, I mean, you might think this is too minimalist because it is Scandinavian, it doesn't matter. But the point is, it actually feels quite nice when you're in this space. This is part of an airport corridor. But I find that the cities people say they love when you interview them, you can't do them. Because developers have land banks, they want to do their own thing because rules often don't help you do these things and so on. So it's absolutely, in Britain for example, often impossible, even though people say they want certain things, which are this sort of softer, um, charm type stuff that we're talking about in George Street, that there are obstacles in doing that, which are to do with rules and regulations often, which in fact, of course I'm arguing, you can reverse. So it is about rethinking the rules and you know getting out of the box. <laughs> Interesting conference I went to, you had to wear those things <laughs> just to see if you could get out of the box. After about 10 minutes, you certainly want to get out of the box. <laughs> uh, actually, I think I'm going to stop there because if you're in the box, you, know, you always have a partial view. And I think I've talked enough, and that's it. Let's keep to the box. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>